Thank you for liking and commenting on this story. I love to read what you have to say. If you haven't already, please push the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on a story. Above all, please share these stories with your friends so you can help the Black Dog Chronicles to continue. Undesirable Guests by William Charlton Read for you by Hugh Carr Matthew and Julia Brooke were a busy couple. They had a house in London and a house in the depths of Derkshire, and travelling between the two would alone have sufficed to keep them occupied. Matthew worked in London as a partner in a firm of investment managers, and the house in Derkshire was a shooting lodge from which he farmed an extensive, if not very productive, tract of moor. Julia lectured in London on the history of art, and in Derkshire, when the rain stopped, attempted conventional but occasionally saleable landscape paintings. Unemployment, then, was not a problem for them. Neither was childlessness, since they had two young girls of school age and a boy just emerging from babyhood, and they had a full social life. In London, they gave and attended many dinner parties. The remoteness of their Derkshire house was a deterrent to no one but themselves. No sooner had they taken possession of it than friends whom they had not seen for years settled in places as far away as Hong Kong and Venezuela came posting back to England to inspect it. As for their relations, and they had plenty of those on both sides, they seemed to spend the whole year queuing to come, and much bitterness was generated if anyone jumped the queue. Take, for instance, the Christmas which had just passed. For Christmas itself, they had Julia's parents, her unmarried elder sister, and an Italian lady with whom Julia had been at school who had subsequently married and then been divorced from an alcoholic, and who was now recovering from a nervous breakdown. Before this not ideally assorted party, they had had Matthew's grandmother, who had nearly died of a bad cold, and a modern historian who made love to their mother's help. For the new year, they had been expecting the Fieldings, a congenial family with children the same age as their own, but the Fieldings had called off at the last moment. It was not to be supposed, however, that this would give them several days to themselves, since the demands of their Dirkshire neighbours were still unappeased. Don't forget, said Julia, the morning after they had dispatched her Italian friend, that we're having dinner with the Anglebys tonight. Matthew had forgotten. Can't we put them off? We've put them off twice, and they gave us a choice of every day this week. Matthew continued with his correspondence. Look at that, he said suddenly, holding up a letter. Now we're in real trouble. Now the ceiling's falling in. Seraphim Durness is coming tonight. Oh no, can't we put him off? Quite impossible. We don't know his address. And anyhow... He'll already be on the way. He can't be. How could Seraphim be so inconsiderate? Look and see for yourself. Julia took the letter. Seraphim Durnez was an old friend whom Julia nevertheless regarded with some mistrust. His name was at once suitable and deceptive. As a boy, Matthew had first known him at school. He had looked like an angel but already one of the fallen tribe. And his beautiful but reckless appearance was a fair reflection of his personality. From an early age, he had formed a habit of doing exactly what he liked. This habit had led to his early departure first from school, subsequently from Oxford, and eventually from England. 
In recent years, he had been heard of in a succession of very out-of-the-way places where, it was supposed, obstacles to doing what he liked were still few. His letter was dated from Lima in the first week of December, which suggested it was not wholly his fault that they had not had more notice. My dear Matthew, it began, I shall be in England at the end of this month, and I am going up to visit my aunt at Arvin. Could I possibly stay with you on the night of the 30th? I know you'll be in your beloved Dirkshire then, and I know how Julia's marvellous hospitality can always stretch the house to hold one or two extra people. I'm not sure you heard of my marriage, which was a quiet affair. Mercedes is with me, and I'm eager for you to meet her. My God, said Julia. It's not just Seraphim, but his wife. Read on, said Matthew grimly. See what he says about her. You don't know half of it yet. She looked after me wonderfully last year, Julia read, when I was sick in the mountains, and I really owe my life to her. Even now I'm afraid you'll find me pretty much of an invalid. But Mercedes gets me everything I need. I'm sure you will like her. She is an Indian who knows more about Indian customs and ever gets into the anthropological books? No, that's enough, said Julia, handing back the letter. Seraphim's an invalid and his wife's an Indian. Do you think she speaks English? Broken Spanish, I expect. That's all right, my love. You speak Spanish. You can hear about the Indian customs while she's getting Seraphim his special food. Special food? Julia had a horror of visitors who needed special food. Doesn't say anything about special food. I thought it was implicit. But perhaps he was referring to urine bottles or portable oxygen tents. Seraphon must be in a bad way if he describes himself as an invalid. In fact, I thought his handwriting looked shaky. I don't believe it, said Julia. But look here, Matthew, what about the Englebys? I don't want to cancel our dinner with them. Why should we? When the Durnesses come down on us without any warning at all? Well, you needn't. If they're coming at tea time, they can babysit. Days are short in Darkshire at the turn of the year, and today darkness started to gather immediately after lunch. Looks like snow, said Matthew. I don't think so, said Julia. It's very mild. Don't like the colour of that sky, said Matthew. It was, in fact, an unhealthy greyish yellow. We shall have rain turning to snow when it gets dark. We don't want to go out with the Engelbys and find we can't get back. The Brooks house was at the end of a long private road, which in turn was at the end of a narrow and indifferent public road, running partly across empty moors, and partly along a high, unpopulated valley. It was often cut off for several days in winter, but seldom before January. Julia appreciated that there was some risk, but they could not cry off their engagement while the temperature was so high. If there's really snow about, the Durnesses will meet it in Dankershire and stay in a hotel, and then we'll have the excuse that we can't leave the children. For a while, it looked as if this excuse might materialize. Night fell. The hour for tea came and went, and there was no sign of the self-invited guests. In order, however, that they might still be able to attend their dinner if the Durnesses arrived, Matthew and Julia fed their older children, settled Henry, the youngest, for the night, and started to change into evening clothes. They were still changing when they heard the arrival of a car. One of the reasons why Matthew had been less dismayed than Julia by Seraphim's letter was that he was very curious to see Seraphim's wife. He could remember a fairly rapid succession of women in Seraphim's life, and although they had sometimes been deficient in intelligence, education, breeding, good character, and even sanity, they had all been extremely striking to look at. 
he wondered what Oread, or primitive, Eve-like figure, Seraphim had found in South America. He was disappointed. Mercedes Durness was a woman of middle age, dressed in black like any respectable South American matron, and she spoke tolerable English. If the blood of the Incas ran in her veins, it showed only in a certain squareness of figure and woodenness of visage. Having shaken hands with Matthew and Julia in a matter-of-fact way, she devoted herself to unpacking the car in which they had arrived and looking after her husband. As for Seraphim himself, he was indeed something of an invalid. The angelic, or diabolical, light had left him. Julia was in such a hurry to be off, and Mercedes was so much to the fore that they hardly saw him. But Matthew remarked on his changed looks as they drove away. Seraphim looked in very bad form. I've never seen anyone so white. I hope, said Julia, he's not going to collapse on us and be unable to leave tomorrow. The Brooks were happy to be used as a hotel, but they did not like, as happened all too often, being used as a nursing home. They said they were definitely going on. What did you make of all the stuff they had in the car? It looked as if Seraphim was carrying his coffin round with him. I expect it's the oxygen tent you were telling me about. His wife seemed very efficient at looking after him. Yes, I got the impression she was competent. Makes me happier about leaving the children with them. Had you been worried then? Well, Seraphim isn't a conspicuously responsible fellow. And you couldn't know what sort of wife he might have picked up. Though, he did say Mercedes was capable of nursing. Julia did not reply. Matthew glanced at her. You look as if you still have reservations. Oh, she said. I'm sure she can cope. It's just that she's so much not Seraphim's type. I suppose it really is Seraphim. What an extraordinary suggestion. Of course it's Seraphim. Who else could it be? But I do wonder what exactly is wrong with him. Matthew's train of thought was interrupted by snowflakes on the windscreen. There you are, he said. The rain's turning to snow. It won't lie, said Julia. Besides, you've got the shovel in the back. You can never get completely stuck if you've got a shovel. They had not had time before they left to do more than show their guests where they were sleeping and explained that there was food on the hot plates in the dining room. Their two older children were in bed, and their youngest was already asleep. The dinner set out on the hot plate was inviting, and would not improve by being kept. It would have been natural then for their guests, provided of course that they did not require anything special in the way of diet, perhaps after a few minutes in their room, to go to the dining room and eat. But that was not quite how they acted. Seraphim had emerged from the car, an even more decrepit figure than the Brooks, in the darkness of the night and the haste of their departure, had properly realized. He had not gone up with his wife to see their room, but she had deposited him in the hall, where the only sign of life he gave was a low mutter of apology for coming so suddenly and being so ill. When the Brooks had left, Mercedes picked him out of the chair, more like a life-size dole than a human being, and took him into the kitchen. Not long afterwards, a loud shriek rang through the house. The two Brooks' daughters, Lucy and Amanda, slept in the same room. They had not yet gone to sleep, and this cry alarmed them. It sounded like their brother Henry, of whom they were both very fond. But it did not come from his room, which was a couple of doors away and opened into their parents' bedroom. They wondered what they should do, and after some consultation, patted down the passage 
and looked into Henry's room. He was not there. They turned round to find the visiting lady watching them from the top of the stairs. Where are you looking for the little boy? She asked pleasantly enough. He had a bad dream. And I have taken him down to the kitchen to give him some hot milk. May we come too? Asked Amanda, the younger sister. No, you would get cold. You must go back to bed. The little boy will be all right in a moment. And then he will go back to bed too. The girls returned to their room, but they were not reassured. The cry they had heard had not been the sort of cry a child emits in their sleep. It had the unmistakable urgency of waking terror. Neither was the reason given why they should not come down, that they should get cold in the kitchen, at all convincing. I think Henry's hurt himself, said Lucy. The visitors are looking after him, said Amanda. But Lucy was nearly nine and had a sense of responsibility. She was not prepared to leave things in the visitors' hands. I think Mummy and Daddy ought to be told. But how can they? They've gone out to a party. We could telephone to them. Amanda did not like that suggestion. Ringing up parents at a dinner party is not something children are encouraged to do. Instead of voicing this real objection, Amanda said, The lady told us to go to bed. What if she saw us? She won't see us if we use the telephone in Mummy's room. In the end, Lucy brought Amanda to agree to this. They managed to gain the telephone by their parents' bed unobserved. But unfortunately, they did not know the right number. You must look it up in the book said Amanda. Lucy had never looked up a number before, and she had no real chance. The name Engleby may sound uncommon, but it is not uncommon in Duckshire. When Lucy at last found the right page, she was confronted by several columns of Engleby's, and she did not know to which of them her parents had gone. She tried dialing the first number, but it was not the right one, and in any case she had omitted the dialing code, and therefore received only a dismal whine. The two girls were discussing what to make of this, when they were interrupted by the voice of the visiting lady. What? Playing with telephones? She asked reproachfully. I thought you were in bed. We were ringing up Mummy. Well, don't you know that children must never ring up their parents when they are out at parties? The girls' faces showed that this shot had gone home. But do not look so sad, the visiting lady said. I will make it so you can play with the telephone and it will not disturb your parents or cost any money. The wire from the telephone ran to a little box on the skirting board under the bed. The visiting lady took the wire and pulled it out of the box as easily as you might pull a thread that was hanging out of a piece of material. Now, she said, you can telephone. The lady's movement had frightened the children. We don't want to telephone anymore, said Lucy. Besides, it won't work now. Yes, it will, said the visiting lady. Try it and see. It can't work, said Amanda. Because you've broken the wire. Why don't you lift the receiver and try? The lady repeated. Reluctantly, Amanda took the receiver off its rest. As soon as she had done so, she heard a voice. It was not like an ordinary voice. More like one of those recorded messages which you tend to get when you ring up the electricity board to complain about a power failure. Your parents have gone away now, it said. And there followed 
a sound like a laugh. Amanda dropped the receiver and started to cry. She doesn't like this game, said Lucy. I think we'd better go to bed now. Even if the children had succeeded in ringing up the right Englebys, they would not have been able to speak to their parents, since their parents were putting to the test Julia's theory that one can never get completely stuck if one has a shovel. The rain had turned to snow with a vengeance, and was being driven across the moors by a howling wind. To begin with, it had merely swirled before their headlights, reducing visibility to a few yards and forcing them to slow down to 20, to 15, at times to 10 miles an hour. But the slower they went, the more time they gave the drifts to build up, and they soon found themselves bumping over ridges of snow and feeling snow scrape the bottom of their car. Eventually, they ran into a drift that they could not drive through. They got out and put on their boots to start digging. It was extremely cold, and the snow was blinding. I don't like this, said Julia. It would not do for both to lose heart, and Matthew's spirits rose to the occasion. It's a dirty night, but it's fun to be out in it. This drift isn't much. We'll be through it in no time. Do you think we ought to turn back? That would be defeatist. If we don't turn back now, we shan't get back tonight. There'll be no hope of getting back from Stilburn. And then what about the children and the Durnesses? Oh, they'll look after each other. Lucy's a sensible girl. The fact is, I'm not sure we could get back now if we tried. The drifts are piling up all the time. And we're over the highest part of the road now. It would be easier to go on than back. Matthew was certainly right on this point. In another mile or so, they would be off the moor and might hope to be below the worst of the snow. Both of them contrasted in their minds the certainty of warmth and hospitality at the Engelby's house. With the risk of having to spend the night in their car somewhere between their present position and their home. Such a night could be very unpleasant indeed. Though perhaps no worse than the night on which Lucy and Amanda were launched. After the episode of the telephone, they had returned to their room, but there was no question now of their settling to sleep. I wonder when Mummy and Daddy will come back, said Amanda. Let's watch from the window. Their room looked down the valley and on a fine night it was possible to see approaching headlights far away. But tonight, of course, all they could see was snowflakes. After a while, they turned away from the window. I don't like it here, said Lucy. We don't know these visitors. Let's get dressed and wait for Mummy and Daddy with the Dodsons. What, go out of the house by ourselves? asked Amanda dubiously. We could get out by the back stairs and the kitchen door. What would Mummy say? We'll say we went out because we couldn't get to sleep. This was a regular excuse for her regular behaviour at night. Amanda did not criticise it, although it was obviously thin, and neither child made any reference to their brother, Henry. They succeeded in getting some clothes on, but not in stealing out by the back stairs. Seraphim was standing outside their door. I thought you might not have gone to bed yet, he said. There was some color in his cheeks now, and his voice was much stronger than it had been when he arrived. How late you stay up. Would you like a game? We were just going to bed now, said Lucy. And why shouldn't you have a game? Your parents won't be back tonight. It's snowing too hard. Have you ever played 
devil in the dark? No, it's a game for winter nights. All the lights are put out, and one person is devil and has to catch the others. The others try to run away from him. I'll be devil. You'll find it quite exciting. Mummy doesn't like us playing games after she said goodnight to us. Ah, but she won't know, will she, what we do tonight. Besides, it's too late now. My wife is just going to put out the lights. He had hardly finished speaking before all the lights went out. <laughs> now, came Seraphim's voice with a laugh. Which of you can I catch first? The laugh sounded just like the sound they had heard over the telephone. The children started to run. It was very late when, after digging through many snowdrifts, Matthew and Julia reached Stilburn. Dinner was over and, in the large hall, lit by shaded lights, some people were playing cards and others were sitting round the blazing fire. Rupert Engleby came up and greeted them with warmth and some relief. Well done. I rang up to hear if you were coming, but the line must be down in your part of the country. I couldn't get a ringing sound. You must be in a dreadful state. There's food waiting for you. But what would you like to start with? Hot whiskey, Toddy? Ordinary whiskey? I'll get some. You'll stay the night with us, of course, said his wife, who had risen from the card table. What about the children? Is Mrs. Dodson with them? She'll be able to cope. She'll have to, said their host, coming up with the whiskey. Can't possibly get back in this weather. Matthew took his glass and drank gratefully and deep. As it happened, the Dunesses, some friends of ours, turned up unexpectedly and are spending the night. So Mrs. Dodson is all right. Is that Lord Duness? Came a voice from one of the card players. A stout, very clean-looking man in a green smoking jacket. Matthew thought that he recognised in him one of their heavier Darkshire neighbours, a Dodson of the Dean, perhaps, or one of the spurious drink bottles. Yes, do you know him? I met him in Bolivia last year. An extraordinary fellow. He was living with a native woman. He seems to have married her. She's with him now. Better him than me. She struck me as a most unattractive lady. And she had a very queer reputation. Really? Asked Julia. What for? You'd never believe it. When I was staying in Cochabamba, the chief of police, who I found a very decent fellow, whatever some people might say, as a lot of nonsense gets into the English papers about the Bolivian police. The spurious drink bottle looked around aggressively to see if anyone would dispute this. Go on, said Matthew. What sort of reputation? As I was saying, the chief of police told me that one of the chief troubles they have in the mountain villages is vampirism. There was some mirth at this, and the speaker flushed. You may laugh, but I can tell you it's no joke to the villagers to have their children disappearing. Anyhow, this woman was suspected of having inclinations that way. I dare say there was nothing in it, but if I had been Dennis, I shouldn't have cared to let her get her teeth into me. <laughs> this time, the laughter was confined to the spurious drink bottle. It was thought that the joke, though harmless was a little ill-timed. Next time on the Black Dog Chronicles One man abandoned in the ocean learns that terror is as deep and dark as the sea. Man Overboard by Sir Winston Churchill. Don't forget to subscribe 
and push the notification bell so you don't miss out on the next story. But remember, 